Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this podcast, Michael St Moore Shield talks about his exhibition of photographs of First World War battlefields today, Fields of Battle, Lands of Peace. He picks out some of the images that have a particular resonance for him. To see a slideshow version of this podcast, go to youtube.com and search for Chrome Radio, all one word. My name is Mike St. Moore Shield. I'm a photographer. We are here in the Upper College Hall of St. Andrews University, where I've been invited by Professor C. Hugh Strawn to present my photographic exhibition, Fields of Battle, Lands of Peace. The exhibition came about in 2005. I'd been a career-long photographer. I was thinking about what I was going to do in my declining years, and I thought about the centenary of the First World War. I knew nothing about military history and was fortunate enough to come across the name of somebody in a bookshop, thought, oh gosh, she teaches very close to where I live, and I managed to get 15 minutes of his time. That 15 minutes has grown into this exhibition project because the man I went to see was the late, great Professor Richard Holmes. This exhibition, we conceived it over what Richard would call good glasses of strong red infuriator. We needed to look at the centenary of the First World War in a different way. It's a hundred years ago, there's no longer memory of the First World War, it's now history. That's what we wanted to reflect, but Richard was also insistent that the pictures had to tell a story. P.J. Campbell, as he was leaving the Somme, he wrote, They were everywhere. They would not be lonely. There were too many of them. I saw that bare country before me, the miles and miles of torn earth, the barbed wire, the litter, the dead trees. But the country would come back to life. The grass would grow again. The wildfires return, and trees where now there were only splintered skeleton stumps. They would lie still, and at peace below the singing larks, beside the serenely flowing rivers. They could not feel lonely. They would have one another, and they would have us. We belong to them, and they would be a part of us forever. That struck us as a perfect brief, because these photographs are all of battlefields, of places which a hundred years ago were places of death and destruction and horror. But today, time and nature have healed the wounds of war, and they are places of great beauty and tranquility. We originally wanted to do a book. I was very fortunate the Commonwealth War Graves Commission asked me to do their centenary book, and that enabled me to travel effectively to every theatre of the First World War, apart from Mesopotamia, Iraq. But we then decided that a book was a bit precious, in the sense that only people who are interested in the subject would buy it. And we felt that with the centenary, this was a war which had involved the entire nation. So we wanted a means of presentation which would get out there to the public. We came up with the idea of outdoor photographic exhibitions in public places. The idea is that people who would normally never go to a museum or an art gallery, they're walking along and they bump into the exhibition. They see a picture, oh, what's that? And hopefully they then get enticed to spend time with that exhibition and immerse themselves in the subject. It has really worked. We first exhibited in 2014. The exhibition has been now in nine different countries, over 30 cities. And we've had an audience now of over 10 million people. There's no other exhibition of its nature to do with the First World War. And each year we change the exhibition to reflect the centenary year or the location it is. So at the moment we've got an exhibition in the States which deals with the American doughboy experience in the First World War. And here in the UK we're touring an exhibition which really concentrates on the Commonwealth and the multinational aspect of the war because we Brits are, I think, rather bad at considering that other people were involved in the war. There were 1.2 million Indian soldiers. The chastening thing is when you mark up on a world map all the countries that were involved and then you mark up the countries that were not involved, on our world map they're in white. There's hardly any of the globe in white. I'd never looked at it like that before. It was only when we were designing the map, it really struck home. 
the incredible global involvement. The first picture, which I'd like to talk about, because it has become quite an iconic picture, not just for me, but for many other people, is what's known as the London Irish football. And no, this is not the Christmas truce football. The Christmas truce football match, there is no primary source. It's a lovely idea, but it is not a historical fact. People probably kicked something about, but there was not a match. But the London Irish football is a historical fact. It's well documented. What happened was that on September the 25th, 1915, the men of the London Irish rifles got out of the trenches to attack German positions at Luce in northern France and as they went they kicked a football. There was a writer present on the day, a man called Patrick McGill, he was an Irishman, he was a stretcher bearer and his description is, as they go across this, were the men wavering, no fear. The boys on the right were dribbling the elusive football towards the German trench. By the German barbed wire entanglements were the shambles of war. Here I came across dead, dying, and sorely wounded. And I saw bullet riddled amongst the spider webs known as chevaux de frise, a limp lump of pliable leather, the football which the boys had kicked across the field. I think it's extraordinary, the thought of men charging towards machine guns, kicking a football. I'd known about the football because my father served with that regiment in the Second World War. I rang them up and said, do you still have the football? And they said, yes, and I went and saw them. I said, well, by any chance, could I take it back and photograph it on the battlefield? Ah, oh, we see no reason why not, they said. Now, that makes museum curators go white. A hundred-year-old artefact being handed over to a stranger, but they did. And the photograph shows it, if you like, on its home ground a hundred years later. It brought a bit of a lump to my throat when I was photographing it. When you touch that football, you really are touching the men on the battlefield. If we move on to uh, the picture taken in Passchendaele, the Battle of 1917, it's a shell lying there on the ground. It's estimated that probably 25% of the shells that were fired failed to explode. So 100 years later, shells are still emerging, particularly when the fields are ploughed. It's called the Iron Harvest. Now, if one of these shells was found lying around here, all hell would break loose and there'd be blue and white flashing lights. But in France, it's part of life. In 2015, they collected 180 tonnes of unexploded ordnance. That's explosive and gas shells. As you walk around, you will see piles of shells by the corners of fields waiting for the bomb squad to come along and pick them up. This next picture, this is a photograph taken on the Ancre marshes of the Somme. This represents the literary involvement of people in the First World War. It reflects on J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of Lord of the Rings, who was here in 1916. He relived his experience when he described Sam Gamgee, the hobbit, in the Dead Marshes. His face was brought close to the surface of the dark mere. The lights flickered and swirled. For a moment, the water below him looked like some window glazed with grimy glass through which he was peering. He sprang back with a cry. There are dead things, dead faces in the water, he said with horror. Dead faces. These are the marshes of the Ancre. And we know that if you were wounded and you slipped off the duck boards which you used to cross the mud, you fell in and that was it. You were likely to drown. The marshes are still there, but it's really rather beautiful. Fields of battle and lands of peace. Now, this next photograph, I was very honoured to be allowed to take this picture because this is almost certainly the last battlefield grave on the Western Front. The body has been removed, but the cross marking where the body was with the soldier's helmet atop is still there. It's Corporate Edward Ivaldi. And he is killed in April 1917. And there's a plaque there left by his father in 1919 along with parts of his equipment. There's his belt, there's a bit of a boot, there's his bidon, his drinking bottle. At the end of the war, there would have been thousands of these along the Western Front. But this is the last one. It's kept very closely guarded by the French army. I am not allowed to tell anybody where it is. I do feel very honoured to have been allowed to photograph it because this man represents what would have been hundreds of thousands of such men, such crosses, dotted along the Western Front. We British, we tend to look at the First World War, I think, through the letterbox of July the 1st, 1916. 
a disastrous day, 20,000 dead. Well, actually, if you go back to August 1914, August the 22nd, the French lose 23,000. What we have to think about is what did these men die for? What lessons can we learn? And if we don't learn those lessons, remembrance is pointless because what are we remembering them for? When I first asked Richard about whether he got emotional on the battlefield, he said, if I'm not getting emotional, I'm not thinking about where I am. But then he said, but Mike, you must not be an emotional Celt. You must ensure you always tell a story. So I do want these pictures to stir emotions. I do want people to think about what happened here, but I also want them to think about the future because if we do not conceive of a better future, then these men died for no reason whatsoever. Now, this picture here is called the Rabenbuhl Friedhof. This is a German cemetery. When you look at the young soldiers, the Germans, the Austrians, the Turks, whoever the enemy was at that time, many of them were young men doing their duty as they were told by their fathers. So I think we should honor the dead of all nations. The Turks certainly do. There's a famous speech of Kemal Ataturk about whether they're Mohammed or Johnny, now they lie on our soil, they are our sons and we will care for them, which I think is incredibly moving and very important because it does show that you can have real reconciliation after the war. These young German soldiers, they went to war full of national pride. And I think we should respect them for what they were, because they were young soldiers doing their duty. This is, I think, one of the most haunting memorials on the Western Front. It's known as the Brooding Soldier. It's a memorial to the Canadian soldiers at Vancouver Corner in Flanders. And this is a memorial to the Canadians who, are in April 1915, when gas first was used, they came in and held the line. There's an extraordinary story about it. There was a doctor close to the front lines. He smelt the chlorine gas and realized that the antidote to chlorine was an alkaline. So he told people to piss on the handkerchiefs and stuff them in their mouths. Um, quite a thought. <laughs> gas has become a very emotional thing. But in fact, when you look at the figures of how many men actually died of gas, it's a very, very small number. It shows how our emotions can be swayed. Wilfred Owen wrote those powerful words, Gas, gas, quick boys! An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime, dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning, and in all my dreams before my helpless sight he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. And this final photograph, well, this is Tynecott Cemetery in Flanders. It's the biggest British war cemetery in the world. There are 11,000 men here and about another 34,000 names on the back wall, unknown dead. It's one of the few pictures I took where I knew exactly what I wanted to get before I went there. I wanted it to look bare and desolate and lonely because when King George V came here in 1922, he simply said, I have many times asked myself whether there can be more potent advocates of peace upon earth through the years to come than this massed multitude of silent witnesses to the desolation of war. That was Michael St. Moore Scheel on his exhibition of photographs of First World War battlefields today, Fields of Battle, Lands of Peace. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorn and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. Do join us for our next set of podcasts when we take a look at the role of government in the First World War.